everybody, and welcome to the session on uh, CRISPR in functional genomics and drug discovery, uh, which is part of the World CRISPR Day. Thanks for joining, and of course, big thank you to the organizers and, and Synthigo for putting uh, together this exciting program. And I'm really excited to welcome Scott Martin and Rafaela Soldi um, to give talks in this session together with me. And uh, I will introduce them uh, once they give talks. So let me start by sharing my screen here. So in this session, we will cover different aspects of CRISPR technology used in screening formats and functional genomics format for the purpose of understanding disease and drug discovery. Um, I will give the first talk and uh, focus a bit more on application to brain disease. And I think Scott and Rafaela will, will have a, a slightly more of a focus on both basic biology, but also oncology. Um, my name is Martin Kampmann. I'm an associate professor at UC Ceph and an investigator at the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub. And the title of my presentation is CRISPR-based functional genomics in iPSC-derived uh, models of brain disease. What do we mean by functional genomics? Well, let's take a step back. These are very exciting times for biomedical research because um, through the advances, advances in next generation sequencing, we have, and human genetics, we have a deeper and deeper catalog of genetic variants that are associated with specific human diseases and traits. And, um, and uh, the next challenge, however, is to understand what the mechanism is by which these disease variants cause disease, um, when and where in a person's lifetime they act, and of course, how we could uh, translate such a mechanistic understanding into therapeutic strategies and, and new drug targets. Um, this is a big problem. Um, this graph here shows in the blue bars how um, the number of genetic variants identified in such, such GWAS studies has steadily increased over the last 10 or so years. And the orange line here is not actually the x-axis of the graph. It's the number of functional studies that has been done on these um, genetic variants. So there is a huge uh, need to bridge this gap from to go from genetics to function mechanisms and therapeutic strategies. And there's a huge interest in doing so. Um, a study from 2015 uh, looked at um, the drug development pipeline and um, where, um, um, where different drugs are in this pipeline and uh, found that um, those drugs that th those pipeline targets that were backed up by human genetics um, had a much higher rate of making it to later stages of the pipeline and approval. So human genetics can be an important guide for drug discovery and drug targets. Um, so the approach that in this session we will um, we will present in terms of um, uh, bridging this gap between genetics and function and mechanism and drug dis target discovery is functional genomics. So I'll start by briefly telling you about a functional genomics platform that we have developed in my lab at UCSF and um, then to tell you about uh, um, applications to brain diseases. And of course, this being World CRISPR Day, we will be focusing today on um, functional genomics approaches that use CRISPR technology, which needs no introduction to this audience. CRISPR can be used in screening approaches for gene editing and importantly also for knockouts by introducing cuts that lead to frame shifts and inactivate genes in the genome. I will be focusing on two other complementary approaches that we can use CRISPR technology in the context of uh, functional genomic screens. Um, both of these approaches rely on a catalytically dead version of Cas9, called dead Cas9, that no, no longer cuts the DNA, but that is uh, still recruited to DNA loci in a uh, programmable manner dictated by guide RNAs. And so we can use these machineries, this dead Cas9, as a recruitment platform, for example, for transcriptional repressors, uh, such as the CRAB domain, uh, which can be used to knock down gene expression or transcriptional activators, which can be used to activate genes. And um, when I was a postdoc in the Weizmann lab I, uh, at UCSF, I co-developed a, a genome-wide screening platform based on these technologies that we called CRISPR-I and CRISPR-A. And we showed that we can 
tune up and down the expression of uh, human endogenous genes over many orders of magnitude. Um, and we can ask, how does um, the expression level of a gene of interest affect a phenotype of interest? However, importantly, we can not only do this one gene at a time in kind of a reverse genetic way, but we can actually use these in massively parallel uh, genetic screens um, in order to identify in an unbiased way all of the genes interesting in a biological process of interest. So introduce that context here. Um, let's imagine we have a population of mammalian cells that express relevant CRISPR machinery. We can introduce via lentivirus an expression library for different guide RNAs such that each of these cells expresses a different guide RNA. Um, and then we can screen for phenotypes that are caused by these guide RNAs that knock down, inactivate, or overexpress specific genes. The simplest one to look at would be something like cell survival or proliferation. Certainly very important when, you, when you're thinking about genes that are important for cancer cell survival and proliferation. And so we can simply use next generation sequencing to compare frequencies of cells that have a specific guide RNA at a starting time point and an end time point using next generation sequencing then to quantify which genes affect fitness. We can do this in the presence of selective pressures, for example, uh, a candidate anti-cancer drug in order to understand uh, which genes um, make cells more or less sensitive to that drug. In other words, which of them might be uh, mechanisms of drug resistance or potential synergistic uh, combination therapy targets or synthetic lethal genes. However, we can go beyond survival-based phenotypes. We can couple CRISPR screening to, for example, fluorescent readouts, um, either constructing a fluorescent reporter for a phenotype of interest or adding, for example, a fluorescent antibody for a, a, a protein of interest um, or even a protein state of interest, such as a phosphoprotein. And we can then use fact sorting to separate out cells that have high or low levels of fluorescence and again, ask which genes modify that. And more recently, um, we can also couple um, CRISPR perturbations to very high dimensional readouts, such as single cell RNA sequencing. Using droplet-based sequencing, we can not only capture um, the transcriptomes to get a, get a kind of a, a fingerprint for the uh, cell state that we have, um, but we can also capture guide RNAs that were delivered at the same time to ask which, uh, how does um, perturbation of a gene affect a cell state. Importantly, um, this was done initially mostly in cancer cell lines. And um, when I started my independent lab at UCSF, we were very interested to apply this to other diseases such as brain disease and to conduct screens in relevant cell types. Um, so um, this was a project driven by a, a graduate student, Ray Lin Tian in the lab, uh, where we showed that we can actually introduce CRISPR machinery into induced pluripotent stem cells, human cells that we can generate from healthy donor cells or from um, patients with specific disease mutations. And then we can um, differentiate these into different cell types uh, in published work neurons, but we have made other brain cell types as well, such as astrocytes or microglia. And we can do screens in those non-cancerous differentiated human cell types. And in, in published work, we showed that we can very effectively knock down, for example, at the protein level, genes associated with new degeneration here, a protein called progranulin uh, in these neurons very durably after differentiation. We can um, use this in pool screens to define genes essential in specific cell types. For example, we found that some genes seem to be neuron, neuron essential genes, but they're not essential in some other cell types. Um, again, we can couple this to single cell RNA sequencing or also in array screens to high content readouts such as um, uh, uh, longitudinal imaging to look at morphology, neuroid outgrowth and, and, and phenotypes like that. Um, I want to just give a quick shout out to a resource that we created recently um, the, uh, called CRISPR Brain. And this is a um, open access uh, database in which we are trying to compile um, screens done in such differentiated human cell types to make it very easy to compare side by side uh, different uh, phenotypes and also gene function in different cell types. One of the things we're really interested in is to understand how the same gene could have a different phenotype when knocked down in different cell types and that, how that might be actually the basis for selective vulnerability of certain cell types to certain diseases or um, 
you know, um, be, be the underlying reason that even a loss of function mutation in a globally expressed gene might manifest as a disease that affects a specific cell type or tissue in the body. Uh, so we, we'd love to get feedbacks and, and uh, feedback from the community on uh, what features you'd like to see in CRISPR brain, um, suggestion for future features, as well as, um, uh, you know, if you have data sets to contribute, we'd love to make this a data comments for the whole community. Um, now let's look at uh, how we can um, apply this platform to um, understand brain diseases and identify potential therapeutic targets. Um, there are two major ways in which CRISPR-I and CRISPR-A can be used. Uh, one of them is to try to model disease variants in high throughput to uncover the underlying mechanisms. Um, many GWAS hits are actually changes in non-coding areas of the genome that are thought to control the expression levels of uh, specific genes, um, so-called EQTLs. The problem is that an EQTL could be active in one cell type but not another cell type, and sometimes it can affect the expression of several genes. So then the question is, what is the relevant uh, uh, what are the relevant genes that are affected? And um, CRISPR I and A allows us to directly target those coding genes in different cell types to try to model this in high throughput and understand what some of the downstream phenotypes are and whether there are even convergent phenotypes between different variants that have been identified in human genetics. But today I will show you an example for another way to use these CRISPR screens, and this is to do modifier screens in patient-derived cells. One of the attractive features of iPSC technology is that we can generate cell lines from a patient, for example, with a specific disease mutation, familiar mutation. We can use CRISPR editing to generate an isogenic control cell line. And then we can introduce our CRISPR machinery guide RNAs and differentiate those cells into a disease-relevant cell type. For example, it might be a neuron, but it could also be, for example, a microglia cell, because some of these cell types have been shown to play important roles in, uh, in uh, brain disease as well. And then the question is, can we observe phenotypes in um, these uh, mutant, but not in the corrected uh, cell types, that mirror something that goes wrong in the brain of the patient? Um, that has been successfully done by many groups and such iPSC-based models. Um, but oftentimes we lack an understanding both for how you go from sometimes a single base pair change in the genome to a cellular defect and how you could, um, how, what you could do about it therapeutically. So that's when we actually do modifier screens. We do genome-wide CRISPR-I or CRISPR-A screens to ask what modifies this disease-relevant phenotype. And we do them in parallel and controlled cells, as well as in the cells that have the disease mutation, and ask which genes modify that phenotype. And of course, we're going to find a bunch of genes that will affect that phenotype, regardless of whether we have the disease background or not. But some of them will selectively interact with the disease background, and those can give us a clue for how the disease mutation acts and a subset of them are potential therapeutic targets because they're going to correct the disease phenotype. So I'm going to um, uh, show you a specific application. One phenotype that's a hallmark of neurodegenerative diseases is that specific proteins aggregate in specific cells of the brain in disease. Um, and oftentimes the very same proteins that aggregate can also be found mutated in uh, familiar cases of the disease. And so one of the areas, one of the proteins our lab focuses on is tau. Tau aggregation is associated with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, and point mutations also give rise to familial uh, dementia and other neurodegenerative diseases. Tau is one of the two hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease together with A-beta, but it seems that tau is actually much better correlated with uh, Alzheimer's symptoms than A-beta is. So it's a very attractive target to go after. Um, and uh, for this, Avi Samerson, a postdoc in the lab, uh, investigated isogenic cell lines that have a disease mutation in tau versus wild type. Uh, he found that the disease neurons uh, accumulate a phosphorylated form of tau that's also found in Alzheimer's brains and using confirmation-specific antibodies for tau aggregates for early stage aggregates uh, called oligomers, um, he found that the mutant neurons accumulate this very early on, as early as two weeks, but the wild type neurons don't. And he can also monitor these levels of tau oligomers by flow cytometry. Again, mutant neurons shifted to higher levels of tau oligomers. 
So then RV did a modifier screen, a facts-based screen, as we introduced earlier, to ask which genes give you either higher or lower levels of tau oligomers. And this is a volcano plot summarizing the results from the genome-wide screen. On the right, we ha would have genes that, when knocked down, give us more tau oligomers. On the left, less tau oligomers. Tau knockdown itself was one of the top hits. That was obviously a nice positive control. Um, but we found some other striking patterns. For example, knocking down any of the factors involved in the early stages of autophagy um, gave uh, rise to higher levels of tau oligomers, and that's consistent with the literature that implicated tau oligomers, uh, sorry, autophagy and tau clearance versus knockdown of mTOR. Um, a negative regulator of autophagy actually uh, reduced tau oligomers. And interestingly, um, a, a small molecule screened by Steve Haggerty's lab at, at Harvard Medical School had found the same thing that in, in uh, tauopathy neurons, um, activation of autophagy by targeting mTOR was a promising therapeutic strategy, showing that our genetic approach can, give, can basically lead to potential therapeutic targets that also validate pharmacologically. And Im importantly, though, mTOR is not an easy therapeutic target. We found dozens of other potential targets that we're now investigating as potential therapeutic uh, strategies. Um, I'm out of time, so I'm going to just give the summary to thank um, my wonderful lab. I pointed out people involved in the lab, but uh, we have many ongoing projects in this area. Our collaborators, Michael Ward and Lee Gann. Um, and I thank you for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. And uh, for that, I'm going to look at the Q&A now. Um, and I'm, I'm, uh, the first question is um, from uh, Jesse Primerer. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Not all variants in complex diseases are specific point mutations. Is it also possible to correct for a variable number of tandem repeats? Absolutely. We have repeat expansion diseases such as polyglutamine diseases linked to neurodegeneration. And people have been successful at using CRISPR to change the repeat number to, for example, correct it. Um, and have seen that some phenotypes are linked to that. Um, when differentiating the iPSCs, question from Greg Potter, uh, iPSCs into the relevant brain cell types, aren't the cell types heterogeneous uh, in the culture? And if so, what is the percentage of cells that are of the correct cell type? Great question. One of the systems that we have um, uh, worked with a lot is to use transcription factors to drive very homogeneous um, differentiation of uh, cell types. We have such a system for IPS, uh, for IPC derived neurons, but also um, um, microglia in, in unpublished work and uh, uh, um, transcription factor assisted system for astrocytes. And that get, helps us get very homogeneous cell types, which certainly helps with these large scale screens. Um, uh, Carolina Gary asks, uh, what do you think is the main challenge using CRISPR in a high throughput screening platform? Your point of view with your experience. Um, this is a great question. I think there's a number of challenges and I'm sure the other speakers today will, will comment on that. Um, I think, um, yeah, I think um, one of the things to do high throughput screening is that you need adequate cell numbers in order to get good statistics out of your screen. So if you're working with challenging cell types, such as primary human screens or some of these iPSC derived cell types, I think that's a, that can be a challenge. Um, we have time for maybe another couple of questions. Uh, Trayson uh, Thody asks, does this activation repression only last as long as the presence of, uh, uh, as long as DCAS9 is present? That is correct. So this is actually a good feature of the system that it allows us in an inducible and reversible way to control gene expression. So if you're interested in gene function in a specific time window, for example, during a differentiation process, you can temporarily uh, in, use CRISPR I and CRISPR A for gene perturbation. There are other systems, however, like CRISPR knockout systems that are permanent. And in some unpublished work um, uh, that that uh, we worked on with uh, Jonathan Weissman and Luke Gilbert's lab, we can also use uh, DCAS9 fused to meth uh, DNA methylases. And for that, um, this uh, introduces permanent methylation even after the DCAS9 machinery is gone. Um, and last question I have time to answer is, um, Mark uh, Shibura asks, uh, does this mean CRISPR can be used in editing essential genes? Yes, uh, one of the things we like about the CRISPR-I system is that it gives you a range of partial knockdowns, um, and therefore it does allow you to query the function of essential genes, where maybe 
knocking them out completely would kill the cells, but a partial knockdown allows you to get surviving cells where you can look more at the cellular effects of knocking down the gene. And potentially this partial knockdown might also mimic pharmacological inhibition. Great questions. Um, we might get, uh, get to further questions if you have more time. Um, but now I'd love to introduce Scott Martin. Um, Scott is the Associate Director and Principal Scientific Manager in the Department of Discovery Oncology at Genentech. And uh, Scott is working there uh, using both chemical and genetic screen approaches to both inter to interrogate basic biology, um, but also to uncover therapeutic targets and therapeutic strategies. Um, before joining Genentech in 2015, Scott was at the NIH, first as a postdoc, and then he um, established and directed a functional genomics facility there, which was uh, based on RNAi in the, in the pre-CRISPR days. So, uh, so certainly Scott is somebody who has really deep expertise in functional genomics, and we're really excited to have you. Thank you, for Scott, for, uh, for speaking today, and the title of Scott's talk is Leveraging Functional Genomics for Target Discovery and Advancement. Thank you, Martin. I just want to make sure, because I can't see you now, can you hear me and see my slides and the pointer? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So thanks so much for that introduction and obviously the invitation to speak in your session today. And uh, as you mentioned, I'll provide a bit of an overview of applying functional genomics at, at Genentech, uh, particularly with the uh, focus on CRISPR-based uh, functional genomics. But I got to admit, that's really tough to do in the time that we have, because we're using functional genomics really throughout all of our therapeutic areas and from very early discovery, basic biology projects through uh, applications in our later stage program. So a lot of activity in the functional genomics space happening at Genentech. And I'd also like to thank you, Martin, for introducing uh, CRISPR screening and some of the basic types of pooled CRISPR screens that we, like all other research organizations, apply at this point. And those range from uh, uh, fitness-based screens where you nicely highlighted that we implicate genes in a fitness-related process like compound sensitization or resistance uh, through guide enrichment or depletion in a pooled CRISPR screening assay. And the second major flavor of pooled CRISPR screen is, of course, the sorting-based screens, which, as you also pointed out, we could use a reporter protein or some sort of staining to sort and isolate a cell population of interest and then look for what guides are enriched or, or depleted in that population to in, in, uh, implicate genes in, in that process. Okay, so I think, you know, as Martin said, I started at the NIH. I, I developed an RNAi screening facility there, and, and RNAi was a great platform and, and certainly very fruitful for interrogation of biology. But I think as we've all seen at this, this point, uh, pooled CRISPR screens can be uh, even more powerful and extremely well-powered to identify regulators of biology uh, under study, especially as compared to, you know, prior investigations and interrogations with pooled-based RNA ice screens. And for example, at Genentech, we've leveraged numerous positive selection fitness screens uh, to identify regulators of, of very basic processes, including various forms of, of cell death, uh, including necroptosis, which is shown here, which is a caspase independent form of cell death that can be triggered by TNF alpha or TLRs and is mediated by key players in this pathway, such as the RIPK1 kinase, RIPK3 or the pseudokinase MLKL, resulting in again this, this programmed uh, necroptosis cell death. And we could do a genome-wide screen uh, for regulators of TNF uh, alpha induced ne necroptosis through positive selection, and we can clearly identify very uh, uh, well the known regulators in, in this particular pathway. But what is extremely nice is that we can get a really high resolution look at the uh, additional biology underlying necroptosis in this system. And we can identify over a hundred additional modest but significant screening hits in applying CRISPR uh, in, in this uh, uh, assay format. And for example, one of those is the RNA binding protein known as PTBP1 which can mask splice site recognition. And further investigation revealed that uh, PTBP1 works to repress alternative splicing of uh, the canonical and major uh, necroptosis component, RIP RIPK1, and thus a knockout of PTBP1 actually results in repression of the canonical RIPK1 transcript, uh, favoring this alternative transcript 
which has a frame shift and a premature stop, resulting in corresponding loss of that RIPK1 protein, and thus uh, uh, confirming or explaining the rescue that we see upon PTBP1 knockout. Okay, so again, we apply CRISPR-based screens in a number of really basic uh, uh, questions uh, with biology, but we also leverage fitness-based screens in many oncology-related applications uh, where we routinely look for modifiers of, of drug activity, for example, or attempt to identify new dependencies in cancer. And uh, uh, those dependencies certainly include those of the synthetic lethality or vulnerability type, uh, where we're looking for novel codependencies that exist in the context of aberrations in cancer, like mutation or gene silencing or copy number gain or loss, with the classic clinically validated example being uh, uh, PARP dependency in the context of, of BRCA loss. And a traditional way to look for uh, new dependencies in synthetic lethality is to conduct screens in isogenic pairs, where we have both the wild type and mutant uh, uh, cancer cell line in a pair. We can conduct a fitness screen and look for dependencies that only exist in the context of the mutant cell background. And we did a, a number of these screens uh, very early on when, when CRISPR first came on to the screen, uh, including one to look for synthetic lethality uh, uh, with uh, mutations in the SWI SNF chromatin remodeling complex, which is very frequently mutated in cancer. Uh, and one of those members of the complex is known as BERG1. And cells that and tumors that harbor a BERG1 mutation are then dependent on its paralog, its functional paralog known as Brahma. Um, and we can then look at, for example, a mutant line, at, in this case, H1299, and see again that this Berg mutant line is now sensitive to knockdown or knockout of Brahma. And we could rescue that dependency on uh, Brahma by re-expressing wild type Berg1. So then we could take this isogenic pair lines and then we can conduct a genome-wide screen to look for new dependencies beyond just the uh, Brahma dependency uh, in, in the context of Berg, Berg 1. So in doing this, uh, uh, you could see in a genome-wide screen using the mutant and uh, wild-type re-expressing isogenic pair that we very clearly uh, identify that dependency on Brahma with multiple guides targeting Brahma being depleted over time in the mutant line as compared to the parental or in, in terms of the re-expressed wild-type. But what you can also see is that through this screening, we identify many additional potential dependencies that uh, exist in the mutant, but not the re-expressed background, including this TRIM37 uh, E3 ligase. Uh, but long story short, what we've learned from doing a lot of these isogenic screens is that many of the hits that we identify in these screens, we could certainly validate uh, in the line in which they were identified, but they turn out to be very private to the isogenic pair model and don't hold up as we test in more additional mutant backgrounds. Uh, TRIM37 is probably one of the better ones of these where we do see an additional mutant, Berg1 mutant background, so that there is some dependency upon loss of TRIM37. But there are a number of models that are mutant for Berg that are not dependent on TRIM37, whereas they are dependent on Brahma as expected. So long story short, many of these isogenic pair screens that we conducted lead into uh, very specific and private observations that don't extend beyond those, those initial screening models. So rather than isogenic pairs, it would certainly be ideal to have a very extensive map of CRISPR knockout screens and dependencies across hundreds of cancer models for a very high powered identification of uh, dependencies and their correlation with particular mutations and genotypes of interest. And fortunately, there's been a number of efforts towards this end, including the Broad's Depth Map uh, project, which has uh, already screened several hundred cancer cell lines to date with genome-wide CRISPR knockout studies. And they also have the corresponding omics data uh, to map and correlate those dependencies with features. And with this data, we can then mine for selective vulnerabilities that only exist in a subset or fraction of the models that have been screened. And in many cases, is by combining with the omics data, we can find strong correlation between that dependency uh, that we observe and the underlying genotype or biology. For example, we see that KRAS is a, a, a context dependency, and that dependency really correlates with hotspot mutations in KRAS a, as expected. And this has certainly led to a number of internal efforts uh, of pursuing novel dependencies and, and targets, which I'm not going to get into today. 
But I'd like to share just one uh, cool vignette, though slightly scrubbed in and of itself. And that deals with having uh, or identifying one of the top dependencies in the data where you only have essentiality upon loss in a subset of the lines. That's a bit paradoxical, uh, paradoxical in that this particular gene is a well-studied pro-apoptotic protein. So that's very strange in that this pro-apoptotic protein um, is essential in a subset of models. Uh, and curiously, this dependency actually correlates with uh, high self-expression of that gene, uh, which can, of course, potentially indicate a role in non-canonical uh, survival signaling and the maintenance of fitness. Uh, and for you CRISPR aficionados out, out there, uh, we initially thought that maybe this was due to copy number amplification of this gene and increased cutting, which can lead to uh, sort of off-target effects or unintentional uh, effects on fitness, but that was not the case. So what, you know, what is happening there? And, and then to add to the puzzle, we then tried to do sort of validation of this dependency in sort of individual format with either RNAi on the left here or even knockout on the right. And we saw that the perturbation of this gene led to really no effects uh, on the fitness of these cells, which are identified as very uh, dependent on this, this gene in the DETMAP data. So I think as a screener, you know, like a decade in screening, your, your first thought is obviously that this is a false positive uh, artifact in the screening data, um, and you just move on, right? There's pl plenty of other things to look at. But before throwing it away, uh, we thought about this a bit more. And one thing to remember is that the identification, this observation, uh, came from a pooled CRISPR screen. And in a pooled CRISPR screening format, we have cells that harbor a knockout for this gene, but all of its neighbors do not harbor that knockout, right? They're wild type for that gene. So could it be that the cells that harbor this knockout are now sensitive uh, to some non-cell autonomous effect and influence from its neighbors in this pooled screening format? And again, long story short, to cut to the chase, this turns out to in fact be the case. And if we culture fluorescently labeled knockdown or knockout cells with parental cells, which are not labeled, we can in fact see that they do induce very rapid deaths, death of the knockdown or knockout cells as compared to the parental cells. And we've done additional, uh, many downstream uh, um, uh, experiments and, and testing of various hypotheses. And what we find that is upon knockout of this gene, it leads up towards uh, significant upregulation of another protein in the cell, related protein, that is now uh, susceptible to sti stimulation by cytokines from neighboring cells uh, to induce cell death. So a very cool story, I think, that you can only ob observe uh, in this pooled uh, CRISPR screening format. Excuse me. So um, but speaking of artifacts, that wasn't an artifact. That was an interesting observation. But no tech or platform is perfect. Um, and that's certainly the case with CRISPR screens as well. Uh, for example, media composition and culture conditions can definitely influence the observations you make. And again, this isn't only applicable to CRISPR screens, but any experiment that, the, that you do. But big CRISPR screening uh, data sets like the DETMAP do a great job at highlighting these biases in the data. And a good example of this is asparagine synthetase, which if you're mining the DETMAP data for highly context selective genes, this is one of them. But if you dive a bit deeper, you find that this dependency really correlates strongly with media composition. And this makes sense because asparagine synthetase makes asparagine, which is important uh, for the cell. And um, when we knock it out in media not containing additional asparagine, those cells or a subset of them can be very dependent upon that loss. Whereas cells grown in RPMI, which is heavily supplemented with asparagine, are not dependent. So clearly a media bias in the data. And you could see many other uh, context dependent genes and observations that relate to media composition as well. Um, and although uh, off target effects uh, are definitely not as prevalent in CRISPR screens as in RNAi screens, um, you can certainly get off target effects with guides. For example, again, if you look at the DEPMAC data, you could see that guides that have increasing uh, matches with the genome with a single mismatch lead to greater and greater effects on fitness on the whole, presumably due to off-target editing. And this is especially a problem for uh, paralogs in genes with high degrees of sequence homology. For example, we identified SOX9 as a very context-dependent gene 
uh, in the debt map data, but find that it correlates very strongly with SOX 10 expression. And we find that that observation is really driven by off-target editing of SOX 10 through guides that have a single mismatch uh, with the SOX 10 gene. Okay, so, um, you know, pooled screening is fantastic. There's lots of things we could do with pooled screening, but there are certainly many phenotypes that we can access with sort of those classic pooled screens that we just described, the fitness and sorting based screens. So very early on, a number of years ago, we looked at the possibility of conducting arrayed screens with CRISPR guide RNAs. And specifically, we wanted to transfect Cas9 harboring cells with synthetic guide RNA, look at editing efficiency and, and penetrance with that type of approach. And we see that within 72 hours in this particular model, that we get very nice and penetrant phenotype with a number of uh, control or targeting a number of control genes with synthetic guides. In this case, geminin, which gives us enlarged nuclei uh, uh, in, 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 because of aberrant DNA replication. So a nice system for confirmation that we can do these screens with Cas9 harboring cells. Uh, and we also can do screens that are cleaner, give us more significant hits than corresponding RNAi screens. We don't always have to use cells that express the Cas9 nuclease as well. Uh, I know a number of people in the community as well, as well as a number of my colleagues in Genentech and this publication that came out recently have showed that you can get very efficient editing and conduct screens through delivery of RNP into non-Cas9 expressing cells. In this case, my colleagues showed that electroporation of RNP into uh, uh, primary myeloid cells really leads to efficient editing. And again, we can conduct screens in that way. Okay, so I just wanted to wrap up again a short amount of time. Hopefully I give you some flavor of, of the types of things that we're doing and the types of applications uh, uh, and assays that can be done with CRISPR. But obviously we, like everybody else, are, are extending the application of pooled CRISPR-based screening into more and more complex ways and readouts uh, from uh, uh, moving beyond single guide libraries to multi-guide libraries, uh, co-stimulation of genes simultaneous in your cell, uh, and moving at, to assays beyond just fitness and sorting screens, including starting to leverage optical pooled screens, which is a technology de de uh, developed by the Blaney Lab at the Broad, where we can couple pooled CRISPR screening with in situ sequencing for more complex phenotypes and more complex models. And also, as Martin pointed out, I think everybody's leveraging this now, and that's coupling perturbation-based screens with single cell readouts for really deep and rich looks at uh, biology through looking at uh, perturbation of the transcriptome. So with that, I already know I'm over time by a couple of minutes. I'd just like to stop here by acknowledging uh, uh, the people on this slide, as well as many additional collaborators at Genentech, especially Mike Costa and his lab, Marinella Callow, Ted Lau, uh, and John Chan, who have, have really helped us get the pooled CRISPR screens off the ground at Genentech and continue to do so. And I thank you for your time and happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you for a very exciting talk and uh, and uh, lots of great uh, examples of the kind of information uh, we can get from screens. One question from Stephen Kennedy is, what are some examples of phenotypes you can't see with a traditional pool screen, since you, you mentioned uh, some of these uh, newer approaches? Yeah, yeah, well, I think one that's hard to even, you know, one that comes to mind is just cyt cytokine secretion and looking for things that sort of exit the cell that you're not gonna measure in the cell itself. You know, maybe you could look for uh, precursors of that within the cell, and maybe that could serve as a surrogate for how much is being produced, which is true in some cases, but I think that's one example, uh, secreted factors. Um, another example, I think, goes back to, you know, leveraging more complex models and looking at, um, you know, images or, or, or readouts that require high content imaging, looking at uh, translocation of proteins or cell-cell interactions in, in those more complex models like co-culture systems or organoids. I think pooled optical screening um, has a chance to, to gain some traction there, but those are some of the things that I think are still remain difficult right now. Great, and uh, we have time for one more question. And actually, uh, Gabriele Corda and Wai Ying Chai have asked related questions. Both ask about how to get uh, robust data, uh, confidence in your hits, you know, distinguishing between uh, false positives or you know some of the more interesting biological cases. How many replicates are needed, um, and and how do you how do you get uh, yeah. robust? Data. Well, there's a lot. There's a lot that that underlies generating good data, right? I mean, it all starts with a good assay. But putting that aside and just focusing on the CRISPR, 
I think it's very important to maintain your fold representation, making sure that hundreds of cells within your population have a corresponding guide uh, from the library. So you, so you have uh, that built in power um, uh, in the data and you maintain that representation throughout the process. That's one thing. The other thing is, is that we um, typically screen up to eight guides per gene in, in our, our genome scale screens. Uh, that leads to more confidence in, in the observations that we're making. And obviously we, we aggregate sort of the significance based on the performance of all guides in, a, in an assay. So there's a lot there, but I think those are really immediate ones is, you know, validation of editing in your model system, maintaining representation, having a good assay um, and, um, you know, statistical approaches in, in, in multiple guides per gene. Lots more there to discuss. Yes, we could talk all day about that, yeah. right? Uh, but yeah, thanks oh, so much. Sorry, we typically do at oh. least triplicate. Sorry, Tri that was in the question. Great. Uh, yeah, and, and and all the speakers can also answer some of the questions that we don't have the time to address live uh, by by typing the answers into the Q and A. Uh, thank you, Scott, for a great talk and and uh, fascinating uh, work. Um, so now we are really excited to welcome our third speaker of the day, Rafaela Soldi. Rafaela is a research assistant professor at the Translational Genomics Research Institute, TGen, uh, where she has pioneered a 3D culture platform and where she is using CRISPR screens to uncover vulnerabilities and combination therapy targets for cancer. And I think we'll hear more about that today. Um, before joining TGen in 2019, she was the uh, director of biology at two um, biotech companies, Beta Cat Pharmaceuticals and Solarius Pharmaceuticals, where she uh, helped to develop uh, two anti-cancer drugs that are currently in clinical trials. Um, Rafaela, we are excited to have you. Um, if you want to share your screen, and the, the title of uh, Rafaela Saldi's talk is Whole Exome CRISPR in Drug Discovery. Thank you. Great. So thank you for inviting me, and sorry for a little technical problem. Um, so uh, at TGEN, uh, our lab, uh, like uh, uh, Martin was explaining, uh, is uh, focused on uh, drug discovery and the development of new uh, target uh, uh, therapy for cancer. And in the last 10 years, we were able to produce uh, two uh, uh, drugs that are now in clinical tra uh, trial, Tegavivint and Seclidemistat. In uh, drug discovery, uh, a really important step is uh, the identification of a good uh, druggable target, and uh, um, which by definition uh, is uh, a protein, a gene, an enzyme that uh, is uh, crucial for the biology and the phenotype of the disease, and that can be modulated by drugs. And there are several strategies to uh, perform drug uh, target sorry, identification, but they can be uh, divided in two big groups, uh, the target discovery group and the target convolution. The target discovery group uh, starts from scratch. Uh, it's uh, the situation in which you don't have uh, targets, you don't have drugs, you know only the biology of the, the drugs, and uh, sorry, the biology of the tumor. And, uh, uh, um, a very uh, useful uh, platform to identify a new target is uh, the synthetic lethality, which by definition, uh, like uh, uh, Scott has played before, uh, is the uh, situation in which the lack of two genes or lack of function of two genes result in that of the cell. This is the approach that we use to identify new target in SCOOT. SCOOT is the small cell carcinoma of the ovary hypercarcemic type, uh, which is a very rare and very aggressive pediatric cancer for which unfortunately there are not uh, FDA approved treatment. Uh, this uh, tumor is driven by a mutation in a loss of function uh, in one of the members of the sweetmeat chromatin remodeling complex, a SMARC4, uh, that is uh, encoded by the gene BRG1, as Scott uh, just mentioned. So uh, in this study, we uh, use the uh, CRISPR uh, library uh, from Syntego to knock down genes uh, one by one in the background of the uh, BRG1 RG1 loss of function to identify genes that uh, uh, the loss of uh, function uh, together with the uh, lack of BRG1 expression result in that of the cells. And for this, obviously, we uh, generate isogenic scoops lines. They were able to uh, re express the BRG1 in an inducible way. Uh, and we use those lines to perform our screening by using the portion of the DNA repair uh, library from Syntego. So essentially, we transfect the cells with this GRNA and Cas9, and after 24 hours, we uh, 
treat, start the treatment with doxycycline uh, to uh, promote the uh, re-expression of the RG1. And after a certain period of time that will last approximately seven days, uh, we then uh, uh, evaluate the viability of the cells by performing the conventional cytotel glow assay. And then comparing, uh, by comparison of the viability of cells that were expressed in the RG1 against the viability of cells that were not expressed in the RG1, we were able to identify some genes that uh, uh, the lack of uh, expression result uh, together with the mutation uh, on the RG1 in uh, uh, that of the cells. So on the top left of this slide, you can see an example of uh, um, uh, a safe plate uh, after the ratio between uh, the viability on the two uh, cell type. And you can uh, read the color by using the um, color decoder that is uh, on the left uh, of this slide. And so you can see that the majority uh, of the genes that were knocked down uh, really didn't give uh, any difference in terms of viability between the cells that were expressing the RG1 against the cells that were not expressing the RG1. However, there were uh, a group of genes in which instead the viability uh, in the cells that were not expressing the RG1, so the matrix of scoot cells, uh, were significantly, was significantly lower. And among these uh, two in particular were very interesting that we val uh, validate again uh, by knocking down a larger scale and using those cells to uh, perform a uh, grow curve to evaluate, evaluate if the uh, loss of viability was due to uh, inhibition of proliferation or that of the cells. So on the left of this slide, uh, you can see this uh, uh, example of a grow curve in which the cells that were transfected with one of these uh, uh, two genes, for instance, the target uh, M15, um, we, uh, we show that the cells stop practically to grow. So this, uh, the inhibition of expression the, of the gene M15 results in inhibition of proliferation. And this is confirmed by our internal control LSD1, which we know that uh, by knocking down this gene in scoot cells results in inhibition of proliferation of the cells. Instead, when we knock down the target K15, uh, initially, we have an addition of proliferation, but then uh, the, uh, the, uh, the cells uh, start to die. And uh, uh, in, in conclusion, these uh, two genes, uh, particularly the uh, um, K15, uh, are very interesting and they can be possibly used for uh, uh, developing new, uh, new drugs uh, for the scoot treatment, which is what we are doing right now. So um, another uh, um, group of uh, uh, strategy for target identification is the target uh, deconvolution. Uh, in this group uh, are in, um, a group, a group the uh, strategy in which the uh, identification of new target depend on the, the effect of a drug. So uh, we use this strategy uh, to identify synergy resistance uh, uh, to, toward a um, treatment that is already used for a, a cancer. So this is the strategy that we use to identify new therapy in human sarcoma. Human sarcoma is another pediatric rare, rare sorry, and aggressive kind of tumor for which unfortunately there are not FDA approved treatment. This tumor is driven by the EW supply fusion protein that acts as a transcription factor that together with the uh, epigenetic factor LSD1, the lysine specific demethylase 1 of the histones, uh, regulate the gene expression that lead them to the uh, human sarcoma phenotype. So in our lab, we actually uh, develop a very potent uh, LSD1 inhibitor, uh, SP2577, now licensed to uh, Solarius Pharmaceuticals for sickly Demistat, and currently in clinical trial in human sarcoma, as well as uh, other uh, solid tumor. And the goal, the goal for our study was uh, to try to identify uh, genes that together uh, with the uh, treatment SP2577, uh, the down regulation resulted in uh, enhancement of the uh, cytotoxicity of this uh, drug in human sarcoma. So we perform uh, this screening by using uh, uh, the human sarcoma cell line SKNNC. They were uh, uh, transected with the sgRNA and uh, the uh, Cas9. Uh, they were covering a, a portion of the synthetic library uh, of genes that were druggable. 
and uh, um, so for which uh, there are known uh, drugs that affect, modulate the effect of those genes. And then uh, after 24 hours, we were treating those cells, a portion of the cells uh, with SP2577 for 72 hours, and after that, uh, performing the viability assay by using the Cetata Glow. In this way, we were able to identify uh, potentially genes uh, that uh, uh, correlate to treatments that can eventually be used to, to, together with the speed 2577 to enhance the uh, cytotoxicity of the treatment in a human sarcoma. And we can even uh, calculate the synergistic effect of the two drugs uh, by using the Chautalalai formula. So this uh, study uh, showed that uh, um, uh, we were able to identify, sorry, approximately 100 genes uh, uh, that uh, were able to enhance uh, the efficacy of SP2577 in human sarcoma cell lines. Uh, from those 100 genes, uh, we eliminated all the genes uh, that were uh, uh, modulated by drugs uh, that uh, are still uh, in uh, uh, discovery uh, state. And uh, we focus only on the uh, drugs that were already FDA approved. And uh, among those uh, 19 genes that were the resulting one, uh, I would like to introduce uh, two of them, uh, ABL2 and SH2B3, because they were uh, independently uh, validated by other studies performed on different kinds of cancer. So ABL2 is a part of the hot hair pathway that is known to collaborate with LSD1 to promote gene silencing. In gastric cancer, it has been shown that uh, uh, the inhibition of ABL2 to, uh, by the satinib, um, together with the inhibition of LSD1 by uh, LSD1 inhibitor, um, result in uh, inhibition of the tumor growth in vivo. SH2B3 uh, is a negative regulator of the JAK-STAT pathway, and uh, has been shown that in myeloid leukemia, um, the inhibition of uh, uh, SH2B3 by pazopanib, uh, actually by the ruxolitinib, um, together with, with inhibition of uh, LSD1 by uh, LSD1 inhibitor, um, result in uh, uh, reduction of number of the myeloid cells in circulation. So to verify if uh, uh, those uh, uh, it that we uh, found in the screening with the uh, Syntego Dragable Library, um, together with SP2577, we perform the synergy assay. So here in this slide, we show the uh, effect of the drugs uh, in the SP2577, which is the clinical compound, and uh, as well the SP2509, which is the tool compound, uh, that are the LSD1 inhibitor in human sarcoma. And you can see that the IC50 is in the low nanomole, uh, while the satinib, which is the inhibitor of ABL2, in the human sarcoma cell lines, uh, uh, has an effect, a moderate effect, uh, is uh, in the uh, approximately 6.5 micromolar. However, when we combine the two drugs uh, uh, together in treatment, uh, you can see that uh, uh, they have a low, uh, low ratio concentration, uh, uh, a very interesting uh, uh, synergistic effect uh, that is calculated by the uh, a combinational index uh, from Chautalalai formula, which show that if it's lower than one, it's synergistic. If uh, equal one, the two drugs act in, in uh, additivity way. Uh, and if uh, higher than one, uh, there is a competition between the two drugs. So we have uh, a local ratio of the two drugs uh, synergy in all points. And this is suggested that uh, uh, the satinib can be used uh, with SP2077 in uh, uh, clinical uh, treatment for urine sarcoma in patients. A similar result we observe with the SH2B3. Uh, like I said, the uh, inhibitor of these uh, pathways uh, are pazopanib and ruxolitinib, uh, two FDA-approved drugs. Um, when we use this, those drugs as single agent on the human sarcoma cell lines, we see that uh, there is not a cytotoxic effect, while obviously uh, our uh, LSD1 inhibitor has a, a cytotoxic effect with IC50 in the nanomoles. However, when we combine SP2577 with uh, pazopanib or ruxolitinib, you can see that actually the uh, uh, combinational index show a very high synergy between the drugs in both cases, suggesting that uh, uh, this can be a very uh, powerful uh, um, combination that can be used uh, in, in a clinical setting for human sarcoma. And this can be also um, 
confirming other uh, unisarcoma cell lines such as uh, A673, A we obtain a similar result. So in conclusion, uh, we can say that the CRISPR technology definitely proved to be a very powerful tool uh, for uh, uh, targeted discovery, but also can be a very powerful tool uh, in uh, a clinical setting uh, to um, help uh, in the precision, so-called precision medicine, uh, to identify the best therapy for a patient. And uh, with this, I would like to thank uh, my group at TIG, and in particular, Dr. Sunil Sharma, our mentor, and my collaborators, Simon Simpson, uh, Tyson Toder, Kevin Brenner, and Esmeralda McCormick. And I would like also to thank the Sintego for their fantastic uh, CRISPR library. Thank you, and uh, I'm hoping for your question. Fantastic. Thank you so much for a really exciting talk, uh, Rafaela. And uh, first question is from Abhishek Saharia, who is asking, have you tested these drug combinations, all double knockout combinations in multiple cell types beyond the initial cell type tested? Yes, for uh, obviously um, time reason, uh, I didn't present all the data, but uh, for instance, uh, in, for the uh, human sarcoma, uh, we showed that uh, we set test on two, and we are going uh, right now testing on another uh, cell type. Uh, all related to unisarcoma. And also for the scoot cell lines, uh, I didn't present the data, but uh, we uh, performed the screening also on uh, uh, the B67, which are another uh, um, uh, scoot cell lines. There are only three scoot cell lines, so we don't have a lot of choice. Uh, but yes, we, we tested in different, we obtained a similar result. Um, And uh, another question. Yeah, why didn't I ask a, a related question about plans to do this in additional cell lines or validate the top hits, given that there's a lot of heterogeneity, uh, even in different cell types of the same cancer type, and they have different sets of dependency. Yeah, I, I think that is basically a similar question. Um, I have another question. Um, uh, in your experience in discovering drug uh, uh, combination therapy targets um, genetically and then validating them pharmacologically, of course, mechanistically, it's different whether you genetically CRISPR a target a gene or whether you inhibit it pharmacologically. So you showed some beautiful examples, but uh, overall, what is the way that which you would say pharmacology is able to validate the genetics findings? Is that is that more the exception or more the rule? in your experience? So we actually just started to apply the CRISPR to this uh, um, approach. And, uh, um, and we are excited because uh, actually uh, we found the two uh, and probably three now, but I'm, we are still doing this research like right now is ongoing. Um, and we were uh, right uh, surprised that it was actually very successful. I mean, the, the drug that uh, were correlated to those genes uh, actually works very well uh, with uh, our compound, SP2577. With that saying, uh, we have to consider that uh, this is maybe only a case. Like you say, the pharmacology that um, not always a target, a specific target, but uh, there is always the secondary effect <laughs> that you need to consider. And uh, plus, uh, those are done right now in uh, a 2D uh, cell type culture, uh, but we are planning to transfer this uh, technology on our uh, 3D culture to, of tumoroid, which not only contain the tumor cells, but also the uh, stroma cells, which have a huge effect on the uh, pharmacological response to you know, drugs. So uh, this is, uh, like I said, this is just the first step. And uh, we are excited about those results because, uh, yeah, maybe it uh, can really help uh, uh, toward our uh, uh, you know, uh, our main goal, which is the precision medicine for patients. Fantastic. And there was a question uh, actually from before, I think for Scott about co-culture, but I think Rafaela, you already made an important point that I think that one of the next frontiers for CRISPR screening is to do it in co-cultures in a more physiological environment, right? Because yeah. clearly uh, vulnerabilities of cancer cells will depend on the environment and, and yeah, definitely. So this will be our next step, definitely. Great. Well, fantastic. We're right on time. So let's thank again, um, Scott and Rafaela for fascinating talks. Thank you for sharing your results. Thank you, Martin. Yeah, and thanks all the participants and, and for the great questions.
and and yeah, again, for real organizing. quick, just want to say thank you to all the participants, uh, including yourself, Martin, as well as Scott Martin and Rafaela. And real quick, just want to make sure folks know, uh, take a moment to attend the expo booth as we are giving away an iPhone 12, iPad, or AirPod Pros for uh, whoever engages and has the most points. And then also make sure to attend the panel at 1230 that'll be coming up and visit all the expo halls and the booths as well. So I want to say thank you. Appreciate it.